I'm joined today by Professor Kevin Folta, who teaches in the Horticultural Sciences Department at the University of Florida, an anti biotechnology activist group called U.S. Right to Know is targeting 40 scientists, including Professor Folta. And Professor, you did a very interesting sort of question and answer on Reddit about this. For people who may not know about U.S. Right to Know and wh in what way you feel you're being attacked, give us the sort of backstory on this. Well, I've been very active in the public discussion of what transgenic organisms are. So this idea of what is a GMO. Um, and uh, I'm very effective in talking about this. I have a number of science communications programs that are public, um, publicly available. And it's that kind of science literacy that the folks opposed to the technology want to stop. And so this is why I've been targeted with other academics uh, for email records and other public records so they can manufacture a story to disparage our reputation. So w it explains the sort of hypothesis that that you believe to be going on here. The public records requests are taking on, are, are happening with the idea of collecting hundreds of emails, thousands of pages of emails from you and, and some of your colleagues and people in the same field with the goal of doing what? Well, I think that the real goal here is to try to manufacture a narrative that if they can get my emails, which they did, that's something like 5,000 pages and uh, a huge amount, that they can take bits and pieces out here and there and create a story that isn't necessarily true. And, or, or find something that is true. I mean, that's certainly there. I mean, you know, if we're doing something wrong, that's what these records should find. Unfortunately, when we're open about our research funding, when we're open about our, our activities, um, they still can go into these and develop a story. And that's the problem, that there's a lot of things that were said, a lot of details that really are very innocent and harmless, but when taken out of context can be made to look very bad. And is the is one of the lines that that you believe uh, is being explored here, the idea of showing either collusion or conflict of interest in terms of big corporations funding the work that you do and the ultimate res, uh, results that come from that work? Well, I don't think that's ever been questioned. I think that no one has once looked at any of the results I've ever published. No one's ever looked at any of the things I've said. No one's ever looked at any of, of my public talks and said, that's not true. Um, what they have done is they've gone into my emails and said, well, here's a place where, uh, where a company has contributed or donated money to his outreach program. So therefore, we can't believe anything he ever says. He's a liar. He is a company shill. He's a pawn of corporations. And that's what we're wading through right now. Um, I haven't done anything wrong. Um, I'm guilty until proven innocent by these by these types of measures. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the sort of dynamics of when corporations fund research. And I think this will be interesting because we hear sort of in broad strokes a lot about, oh, if you have an industry funded study, we essentially cannot trust that study. And I think people might have a, a particular understanding of how it, it works behind the scenes. So give us an example in your experience of if a corporation or industry group does put money towards a study towards, uh, let's say, for example, the the health risks or benefits of a particular food product, for example, or whatever it is. What's how does that usually happen and what level of control might the corporation have? Well, the corporations trust independent science to do this work because we are the experts and we can do things they not, don't can't necessarily do. We also have reputations and transparency. And uh, we're not going to sacrifice those things for a few corporate shekels. Sure, you can point to a place where it's happened throughout history, but the majority of us uh, think about opportunities to to use corporate funding for research as an opportunity to um, enhance our publication records to show the real science. And in a lot of cases, the the, the data they uh, the hypothesis they're testing doesn't necessarily work out. Well, I think that there's there's a couple of other. I mean, that's I, I absolutely have no reason to doubt you personally with what with regard to what you're telling me. But there are a number of scenarios that I've researched and covered that that line up a little bit differently. And there's two from from just the last couple of weeks that I'll present. One is one we're going to talk about later today, which is a a study from a so-called science group 
that in turn is funded by the soda industry and companies like Coca Cola. And lo and behold, that's a group that has come out and said, hey, you know what? We don't really have any evidence that drinking a ton of sugary soda is bad for you, completely at odds with the with the overwhelming uh, amount of, of research. So that's one way right through a corporate funded intermediary group that says, hey, we just we get funding and we do research. And when you look just very, very low below the surface, it is having a huge influence. No, I, I've, I've seen this. I haven't looked into the depths of it, but you can always point to a case where there's something that looks funny. And what happens is exactly what you're talking about. The media in, in looks at it. We look at it carefully. We look at the data and what has brought us to those conclusions. And if it turns out that the, that the researchers are being disingenuous because of financial um, impropriety or collusion or influence, then, then absolutely blow the whistle. So you believe that the sort of status quo, the framework that currently exists, has a way of outing whenever we have these conflicts of interest? I, I think it does. I think it happens very easily in a day of science where um, alternative scientific interpretations are easy to come by. So in other words, if I tell you that the, uh, that the, that the, that the sun is going around the earth uh, and I'm being paid by big telescope, uh, you know, or whatever you can, you can easily test that and show that I'm, I'm not being, uh, I'm not being uh, fair with my uh, interpretations. My case is I received a tiny bit of money for outreach from one of the big agricultural companies from Monsanto that they used to fund my science communication outreach. It's not research. It's not funding my research. My research has nothing to do with them. And I've had over six million dollars in research support over the last 12 years. This is a drop in the bucket that goes to pay for donuts and reimburse me for travel so I can go teach. I mean, this is really nothing to get excited about. Now, that's interesting that you mentioned a drop in the bucket, because one argument that could be made is it doesn't matter how much money you get from whoever might have a sort of horse in the race. Your research is going to be your research. There's another point of view, though, which I'm sort of thinking of as you as you use the term drop in the bucket, which is if it weren't a drop in the bucket, would it be a different situation? I don't think so. It depends on the integrity of the researcher. Yeah. You know, I've spent my entire life doing this. I want to do this the rest of my life. The last thing I want to have is something I would never have some part of my reputation saying that I was bought out or, or somehow influenced by funding to change data. OK, so that that's good, because so kind of the, the first line that we sometimes hear is, well, the, the results of the study were influenced by money. Data was changed or data was excluded, whatever. But I want to talk about a slightly different scenario, scenario, which we recently saw with a study done by NASA on air traffic controllers. I don't know if you heard about this over the last few days. Huge amount of data suggesting that fatigue is a huge factor in air traffic control errors. We know about this study, which is now three years old, only because the AP was able to dig it up. But the FAA suppressed that study. So I want to run that other sort of mechanism by you, which is, yeah, the researchers are paid to do research and they do the research. Honestly, they don't alter data. They don't exclude data, whatever. But then because of the funding mechanism for that entire project, the results are simply suppressed. So how are we hearing about it now? And that's well, we're lucky enough to have heard about this one, but who knows how many we've not heard of. Well, but this this is the point is that we can't we can't live in that kind of a sphere. Mm. We we um for everything that you can find where this where there's this kind of corporate influence and in, in that kind of thing or suppression, I can point to tens of thousands of cases where that didn't happen. And so do we interrupt scientific progress and especially with corporate money, mm -hmm. which now that you know, state and public money is really hard to get. I think it's great that corporations are excited to fund research. And if someone crosses the line and falsifies data because of that type of influence, then put on the brakes. But let's not stop good science, which is happening on someone else's dime, which is really a good thing. Last thing I want to touch on is the group in question here, U.S. Right to Know. I, I have done quite a bit of research into them. Certainly there's er <clears throat> areas where I disagree with them, including, for example, uh, some of the claims they're making around GMO, which, of course, you're very involved in researching. But on other areas, they seem to really be exposing some pretty bad practices by the food industry, fraudulent and misleading claims around so-called diet sodas and artificial sweeteners, etc. Do you have a problem with the group uh, aside from this particular tactic they're using? Do you have a problem with the group's goals and mission? 
Well, I, I, in, in principle, I think anytime we can understand how to make the food supply better, there's nothing wrong with that. The objection I have is when you start going into these, is the problem you have with this particular tactic is that when you start interrogating scientists or public scientists who are ready, my record is completely transparent. You don't need to FOIA me for me to tell you the truth about it. And I told Gary Ruskin, the guy from USRTK before, I'll tell you anything you want to know. Let's go. He said, no, I just want the emails. The problem is when you do this, now you bring in a sense of intimidation and harassment, which limits new scientists from participating in these discussions. Um, I've received countless emails from students, postdocs, faculty who say, I would never do what you're doing because I don't want to endure being dragged through the mud for simply communicating science. All right. We will leave it there for today. Professor Kevin Folta from the University of Florida. Thanks so much for telling us about what's going on. Oh, thank you so much, David.